All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 92, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And um, as you can see here, I'm uh, in my new office, so it's a bit empty-ish now. So there might be some weirdness with the sound. I haven't quite finished moving all the stuff and soundproofing the walls, but hopefully it's good enough for now at least. So let's get cracking. We don't really have uh, that many things today. It was, I, I guess, you know, it's end of December, or like middle of December, I guess, not the end, no, the beginning of, is it, yeah, I guess it's a uh, middle of December, right? No, not middle, beginning of December. <laughs> but people are not quite, uh, you know, uh, getting more relaxed, not doing as much as they used to do during the, well, autumn and summer. So we are not, we don't really have that many things, but we do have quite a few very cool uh, packages and demos to talk about. So as always, uh, the first section is getting started. We got three articles here today. Let's just jump right into them. Uh, hey, Meh Patricks, welcome to the stream. Um, lovely weather in Berlin, rainy dark. Yeah, it's more or less more or less the same here. It's like I'm looking out of the window right now and it's like, yeah, not not the best one out there. <laughs> but okay, back to the articles. And the first one we got here today is back references in JavaScript regular expressions. A pretty nice write up on regular expressions, the capture groups and back references. The feature that I honestly did not know existed in JavaScript, like I've used it, I think in Perl, if I remember correctly, but um, I mean, first of all, capture groups, name capture groups is something that's been added quite some, uh, like just very recently, basically, right? And this is the feature that I, I mean, overall, I think I used it once or twice over my like 15 years of, you know, software development uh, career. And it's kind of like it's sometimes it can be extremely useful, but it's very niche. And I did not know that worked in JavaScript, which is quite well, uh, quite nice. So uh, if you're curious, do check it out. It basically guides you through the back references guides you through the reference string replacements. Like this is a feature I've used quite a bit actually. This can be very handy when you replace stuff within the strings and you just wanna swap places or do something like this. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, it's a nice little write up on the regular expressions. If you already know what the back references and the references within regular expressions and how they work, you won't really find anything new here. Next article we got here is a time series forecasting with TensorFlow JS. Uh, hey, Tea Time, welcome to the stream. Hello from Hamburg. Well, hello from Leipzig. <laughs> okay, uh, continuing. Uh, so, as I said, uh, series forecasting with uh, TensorFlow. So, this is a pretty basic tutorial. Uh, this is a wrong thing to block. I find it a bit funny that um, medium based blocks work better with JavaScript disabled rather than enabled, which is uh, mildly annoying, but you know what? So this is a tutorial basically for TensorFlow.js and how to apply it to do forecasting and predictions on time series data. There is, I mean, the tutorial itself and the, the whole concept behind it is super straightforward. Essentially, um, TensorFlow.js does all the work for you. So all you have to do is just fit it information, train it a bit, and then just use the model that you get to well predict stuff, right? Um, if you, I guess this would be a good tutorial that introduces you to TensorFlow, at least for the basic time series predictions. Um, it's not very complex, it's very straightforward. If you have the use case where you need to do something similar, do check this out. It does a good job of guiding you through that. There is also a GitHub with the source code, but you know, it's not exactly the most complex uh, use case out there. But then again, you know, TensorFlow kind of kind of does all the heavy lifting for you, so you don't have to. And this does a decent job of guiding you through the very basic uh, RNN setup. Okay, uh, last article we got here in getting started section is building a Telegram bot with Node.js. Yes, another one. This is like, I think we have, we have at least one of them every week or at least every couple of weeks because there's been like, four of them or five in the past month. If I, <laughs> It's just too many people building Telegram bots. But uh, nonetheless, this is yet another one. So in this case, uh, it's again uses the Node Telegram bot API, which is quite low level. And I personally prefer using something uh, more higher level like Telegraph. Uh, but you know, it does a relatively good job of explaining you how do you do that with uh, screenshots showing you how to get the tokens and all that kind of stuff and how to write the logic, how to respond to messages. So if you are curious about writing your own Telegram bot, then this tutorial got you covered basically. 
Okay, that is it for getting started. As I said, not much stuff today. Now we got two articles. Uh, the first one is from Mozilla Hacks, and as usual, this you know is tends to be amazing, and this one is not an exception. So this one is titled "Multivalue All the Vasm." So this is an introduction to a proposed extension to core of the WebAssembly that enables functions to return multiple values, among other things. And it's also a prerequisite for the uh, VASM interface types, so the VASI thing. Uh, now, so if you never used VASM before that, you don't know that basically right now it's quite limited, right? So the only thing that you can do when you define a function within VASM is return one value as a result, right? And sometimes they're just not exactly convenient. So this basically multivalue proposal allows you to say, hey, I actually want to return an array of results, right? Which uh, can transfer quite a lot of different, like it basically simplifies your code a lot. So, right. And uh, this write up just goes through showcasing how exactly it will help. What, how exactly does it work? Why does it matter? And how does it all connect to the uh, VASI and VASM bind gen and all that kind of stuff that is already out there and already usable, right? So like the Rust, um, Rust related things. And it is, as usual, like I think it's just uh, all the articles from Mozilla guys is just recommended immediately because they are typically very, very high quality, very fascinating and interesting write-ups. This is not an exception. It includes the example with the cargo uh, that shows you how to build uh, the VASI builds uh, using your Rust module with the multiple return values and stuff like this. And it's, yeah. So if you have any interest in WebAssembly, do give it a read through. If you are not interested in WebAssembly, well, you want, like it's, it's purely WebAssembly. There's not that much JavaScript in here, to be honest, but I still found it absolutely fascinating. Okay, the last article we got here for today is how I created 488 quote unquote live images. This is a pretty interesting write up of uh, how the author uh, took the can I use uh, images that they have. So like, right, if you go to can I use and search for something like Vasm, for example, right, you would get this table that shows you, hey, there's actually the, um, this is the versions of the browsers that you can use, but you cannot really embed that. And this is, you know, the interactive format with hovers and everything. So the author decided to convert that to uh, nice embeddable images, which you can just copy, use it, and you will see the nice generated image that you can embed in, well, anywhere you want, basically, right? So the gist uh, is super straightforward. The way he approached that is uh, actually quite tricky. So first, like there's, there's a full write-up, but the gist is he used the Puppeteer to capture the uh, pages. He then uploaded them to Cloudinary um, and, uh, converted them to required formats, then created redirects to Cloudflare to cache it, uh, and then basically created an API that would uh, deploy to Heroku with scheduled job that would update daily to make it dynamic. And it's also available on GitHub if you want to check how exactly all of that works, because it's not super, not super simple, let's just put it this way. But it's a, you know, really nice uh, exercise, I guess, in converting uh, dynamic data into static images, which I don't know if uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question, would there be an easier way of doing that rather than, you know, using Puppeteer, which is quite heavy to just like physically just screenshot the whole page. Maybe there is a dynamic way of reconstructing that that will be cheaper than Puppeteer, but I don't know. This seems to be working and um, working quite nicely. So if that sounds interesting. Do check this one out. Okay. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We do have quite a few interesting things here today as well. So the first one is the um, modern JavaScript allows, allows you to do lazy loading for, well, just about everything, uh, just using 11 lines of code by using obviously inter intersection observer, if you never worked with it, it's actually super straightforward to use. And uh, this, this is the 11 lines of code that you need to uh, write to lazy load just about everything with your custom lazy loading logic. The idea is very simple. You define a new intersection observer that calls the on hit function. That is your custom callback that just uh, checks if the entry is intersecting. And then if it is, you can just call your lazy loading logic, be it an image loading or whatever else you want, right? 
Once you create it, you basically say that you don't want any margin, which means that it will intersect only when the uh, element is completely on screen. And you want to set a threshold to 20%, which means that it should trigger whenever the 20% of the element appear on a screen. So if you just, you know, it's just barely visible, you start already triggering it. And that's it. Like Intersection Observer is one of those APIs that are uh, super handy whenever you want to do something with the scrolling content. If you never used it, uh, do give it a read through. It's actually very easy to use. Uh, there is some things that it takes a bit, you know, to wrap your head around how it exactly it works, but it's quite straightforward and allows you to do some very fancy things. So if that sounds interesting, do check out this tweet and the documentation linked over here. All right. Next thing we got here is animated SVG fav icons. So if you didn't know, you can use SVGs as five icons for the websites right now. I believe it is not supported in all browsers yet. So, but Chrome and Firefox should support that. And turns out you can actually throw in the animated SVG as well, uh, which would actually animate your fav icon here on the website, which is, I, you know, it's probably infuriating to do that uh, because then half of your browser is going to be jumping and it's like, I, I can almost see the uh, fav icon blockers appearing. <laughs> But uh, it's nonetheless a nice exercise and a nice um, example of what you can actually do. The cool thing is that because it's an SVG, you can actually do animations with CSS, which is something I never thought about before, but it actually makes perfect sense. So there you go. Okay, last thing we got here is an update from um, ECMAScript uh, TC39 committee, right? So they had a meeting this week and there's a bunch of changes to the proposal. Uh, this is a nice Twitter thread that gathers most of them. So we got Intel relative time format makes it to stage four, which means it's done and it's going to be shipped in a browser soon. If you've never seen this API, it basically allows you to format any date relative to another. So you can say, okay, so we got some date and then we just format minus one day, which will give us one day ago. And you can also say which language you want. So it will actually trans translate it to the user's language, which is a, uh, Really handy to have basically. So you no longer have to reinvent your own APIs for that. Next thing is we got the uh, array is template object is pushed to stage two. This is an API I'm not familiar with and I honestly don't know what to tell you about that because I have not had time to dive into it. Uh, next one is we got the UUID and math get random values to stage one. So this is a proposal I have not seen before. And it basically adds the random UUID generation as well as get random values from math function, uh, sorry, the math module that would allow you to natively generate, as it says, random UIDs and just random values, uh, which also sounds very handy. I mean, again, you know, you kind of could do it anyway right now with math.random and some workarounds, but it's just nice to have a more convenient APIs essentially. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Again, the fact that it's, I haven't seen it before and it's already stage one means it's probably going to get to stage three and four quite quickly, which is uh, great news. Um, so next thing is Nullish Coalescing is now stage four, which means it's also complete and going to be shipped in the browsers pretty soon. I believe, uh, I don't know if optional chaining, it's not mentioned here, but I think optional chaining also moved to either stage three or stage four. It was like, uh, it should be next to Nullish Coalescing is essentially, but uh, we're going to have a look in a moment. Right. Uh, the next thing we got here is a rate prototype reject makes it to stage one. So this is essentially inverse of the filter. So you can uh, reject values by using some condition that is resolves to true basically. So exactly opposite of the filter. And yeah, it, I mean, it looks okay. I honestly don't know, like, I guess there are some reasons to have that, but you know, it's not, doesn't seem as important as everything else. And now, the final thing that is highlighted here, and I think this is probably the most exciting one, operator overloading is now at stage one. So this is again the proposal I have not seen, but it's probably one of the coolest ones that I have seen in a while. The idea is that you can actually override the basic operators such as addition, multiplication, comparison, and so on and so forth. So you can actually, when you define your own uh, class, right, or type, whatever, you can say that, okay, I want to actually import this uh, type and I want to import operators from it as well, which, which would enable usage of the custom operators that you define within your type in the current scope, right? I think it is scoped actually, but maybe it's a module scope. But, okay, this is already semantic details. 
And then basically once you define your type, you can create operators overrides that would do whatever the hell you want, right? So you can uh, override plus to just call a custom function and the same for all the other stuff, right? And this, for example, allows doing things like having custom vector classes and then just using plus like addition, multiplication, subtraction and comparison operators as if this was native values while it is actually your custom classes, which is really cool in my opinion. So this is like, on one hand, I can see how this could be abused, you know, like there's always this problem with like people screwing everything up because they write their own DSL essentially and destroy things um, unintentionally most of the time. But on the other hand, this is a really, really cool thing. So just imagine, you know, like for example, we got TensorFlow, which works with tensors. And because you couldn't override the operators, you had to essentially use custom functions, which, you know, is a bit of a pain in the ass and a bit harder to read. Now you will be able to just override those operators and just add, subtract, multiply tensors as is natively without any of that kind of uh, wrapping magic, which is uh, pretty good. So yeah, it's uh, really cool to see that. And I'm curious to see how fast this will progress from stage one to stage four, essentially. Okay. This is, um, this is it for the uh, ECMAScript uh, committee updates, essentially, the proposal updates. The next thing we got here is introducing React View Interactive Playground for your components. So this is a really neat, tiny, embeddable component playground. So it's kind of like Code Sandbox, but specifically for one component where you could actually um, define different properties as uh, switches and then you can just basically click on them and that will display the component itself and it also allows you overriding those uh, props right so it's it's all dynamic but uh, it's it's i don't know what to compare it's kind of like embeddable storybook i guess uh this is probably the best i can do in terms of comparison it also comes in as a react component that you can just wrap things into and show them in line uh, and you know, again, it's, it's actually really neat. So if you're working a lot with the components or you need some sort of a dynamic blog post where you can allow users to edit JavaScript, this might be the, exactly the thing you want because it looks quite powerful. It looks really easy to use. And, uh, the whole gist of it is actually quite nice. So there you go. Right. Uh, next thing we got here is the uh, blog post from w3c.org. Um, now, that's a thing I didn't actually know existed, but um, the blog post is titled Status Update on Web Games Technologies. So apparently there is um, a whole kind of a user group, I guess. I'm not sure if it's like official user group or if it's just a set of people who track it. But essentially, there's a bunch of people at W3C who work on web technologies that are related to gaming. And this blog post outlines the progress uh, within the technologies, exploratory work, technical proposals, and other proposals that's been done in the past year, I guess, or so, with regards to gaming, which is, there is a ton of really cool things out here. Uh, you know, obviously WebAssembly is around here, uh, including the uh, WebAssembly Web API, JavaScript interfaces, and stuff like this. Uh, WebAssembly garbage collector that the gaming community have been, especially I think the Unreal Engine um, developers have been basically asking for from the very beginning. It was like, we cannot port Unreal Engine 4 unless we have garbage collection and stuff like this, which is, uh, yeah, GamePad API. This is something we already had in, in Chrome for quite some time, but it looks like it's going to probably get standardized. And uh, yeah, a bunch of other stuff, including the GPU for web working and other things, that is just crazy web codex and billion of other proposals that look really really cool so if you're into gaming and if you are curious about game development within web um do check it out there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff going on that i've honestly didn't know about uh react view would be great for react presentations yeah that's actually a good point so you probably could embed the stuff in presentations and uh, showcase the demo right on the slide without leaving the uh the slides themselves. That would be actually a very cool use case. <laughs> okay, next announcement we got here is Code Sandbox announces template universe. Uh, so the, you know, Code Sandbox is probably my go-to um, web editor, which you can just jump in and start editing things. And uh, they already had something like templates because, you know, you can just go here, you can say, oh, they changed the interface completely. Okay, you can create a sandbox and then you can just pick, 
uh, okay, they actually already changed the interface. But yeah, okay, before you had those official templates, which was like React, Vanilla, Angular, uh, Preact, Svelte, whatever, right? And now they're expanding that to a lot more and you can actually create your own templates and just use, I, I believe it's just a basically GitHub repo that just has the special structure. And yeah, it's it looks freaking amazing. So there's like a template for e-commerce with React. You can just scaffold it and work on it right in Code Sandbox. So uh, it's really neat. I mean, I'm, I've been a fan of Code Sandbox from the very beginning. I mean, they moved VS Code right into the web, which is already the thing that I freaking love. Um, yeah, it's it's awesome. So just, you know, check it out. Okay, and the last thing we got here is announcement from W3C, another one. So uh, the WebAssembly officially becomes a W3C recommendation. So it's finally at a stage where W3C can recommend it to usage. And it basically means it's mature enough uh, to be considered like the um, yeah recommended WGC technology. So that's great to see. Again, uh, there's future versions, as they say, already in works. So we are still waiting for threading. We're still waiting for fixed with SIMD. We're still waiting for tail calls. We're still waiting for ECMAScript modules integration, WASI and garbage collection, all that stuff. But... Even at the current state, the WebAssembly is pretty amazing. And I have something to show you to prove that a bit later on in the demo section. Okay, that is it for the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we got some releases this week. Uh, so the first one is a pretty big one. It's GOT.js uh, version 10. If you never heard about it, GOT is a very nice uh, query, like how do I call it? HTTP request libraries, what do you call it? Uh, which is, uh, yeah, it's been around for quite some time. It's written by Cinder Soros. Uh, it's great. I've used it in more than one project. It's very easy to use. And version 10 is a major rewrite, right? So they actually rewritten the whole thing in TypeScript. And there's a ton of breaking changes. It's more strict now, more like easier to understand. Um, the parameters makes more sense. There's a bunch of changes to how the retries works and stuff like this, which is uh, great. So if you're using it, make sure to change the breaking uh, to check the breaking changes. Uh, there's also a ton of enhancements. For example, it supports broadly now, which is great. And uh, yeah, again, rewriting in TypeScript means we got the TypeScript definition, like the proper definitions. You no longer have to drag anything um, in addition. You will just get them out of the box. And uh, it looks great. So I just probably need to migrate all my projects to it because I think it's also become quite smaller than it was before, which is also a welcome change. So there we go. Okay, next release we got here is Firefox version 71, which, well, mostly seems to um, improve stuff like, you know, the Lockwise integrated password manager and hence tracking protection. They seem to be going all in on tracking protection. They've also added picture in picture for Windows only for now, which is a feature I know some people really like, but I personally never used it. Like I think Chrome has it for a couple of months now, but I just never, like I have a second monitor. I just move stuff there and, you know, open it on full screens. <laughs> That's what I usually do. But, uh, you know, if you use it, then it's uh, great for you. They've also added na native MP3 decoding on all platforms, which is also great. And there's like a bunch of other minor changes. So if you're interested, do check it out. Yeah, the WebSocket message inspector in DevTools is now shipped in the stable build. So this is great. And um, yeah, that's basically it for the Firefox. It's I'm like, I'm still waiting for the uh, Microsoft to release the Edge, but... The more Chrome changes, the more I kind of start leaning towards Firefox because they almost, like right now, they have almost everything I need from it. There's a few minor things that are still not as good in Chrome, but they're getting there, you know? And it's like, if the Chrome keeps going with that web API limitation and killing the ad blocks, I might just switch to Firefox, back to Firefox. I mean, I've been using Firefox for ages before going back to Chrome, but yeah. Anyway, uh, the next release we got here is Create React App version 3.3.0. So it's a minor release and it adds some uh, new cool features. So I think the custom templates is the uh, highlight of it essentially. Uh, so basically now you not you can uh, essentially create your app from a specific template. For example, you can say, okay, create my app with a template TypeScript and you will get scaffolded the Create React App, but with TypeScript, right? And uh, it basically also allows you to create your own templates where you can do whatever the hell you want with them, which uh, sounds pretty convenient, you know? 
Uh, they've also enabled optional chaining and newlish coalescing by default. By the way, it's a good chance to check what is optional chaining actually is. No, it's still stage three. Okay, so they are only progressed newlish coalescing to stage four, but optional chaining is still at stage three for some reason. That's that's a curious development. Okay, and there's also added like numeric separators. Uh, the no expected, unexpected multi-line is now a warning. And there's a bunch of other minor changes. So if you're curious, do check out the change log. Okay. Next release we got here is Node.js version 13.3, which, um, you know, there's like a bunch of minor changes. The notable one, in my opinion, is the initial support for uh, VASI, the WebAssembly interfaces, uh, system interfaces. And uh, yeah, it's, there's the, the way you use it right now is a bit cumbersome, I guess, uh, but it seems like it's basically aimed uh, towards the library developers rather than everyone else. Um, where was the example? Wait a second. IRBS. Okay. Okay, we can just collapse all of that. I remember I spent like five minutes yesterday looking for that as well because it was a bit annoying that th there's no like official docs that are detailed right now. There's only the uh, whatever you find in the uh, markdown files, right? So the idea is, is this, uh, you import the VASI from the VASI module, you instantiate new uh, instance of it that pre-opens some sort of a sandbox, for example, when you need that, uh, that passes the arguments and environment if you need to pass it. And then you create an import object using this uh, VASI import uh, function, right? And then once you load the WebAssembly module, you pass it the import object as a property options, I don't know. And that will instantiate this specific VASM file within the VASI uh, environment, I guess. Um, it seems like, like, obviously, this is now experimental, so you need to pass the flag for that stuff to work. And it actually needs two flags for all of that to work, which is a bit more annoying. But, you know, it's getting there. It seems like, like you know, looking at the code, this is definitely done for library makers. So you wouldn't want to do that within your app. You actually would want to have some sort of a wrapper that loads your binary uh, from WebAssembly and then exposes a nicer interface to uh, consumers. But nonetheless, having that is really cool. So before that, you could use VASI within Node.js, but you would require basically to use third-party library or WebAssembly engine to do that. But now you can just do that natively, even though, you know, with some flags and uh, minor annoyances, but uh, really cool to see that. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Okay, and the last release we got here is React Native for Windows reaches Milestone 3 update. So if you never heard about it, uh, Microsoft actually forked React Native and uh, named it React Native for Windows. And it allows you to build native apps for Windows using React Native, right? So you can actually use React to write apps, compile them to Windows apps and just ship them. They actually look quite nice and work pretty well. And it's actually quite easy to get started with that. Even I think I tried the milestone one at a time. That was quite some time ago. Um, but even back then it already worked quite well. And now we got the milestone three version, which updates the React Native to uh, version 060, which I believe is the latest one, if I'm not mistaken. I might be mistaken here. I don't remember if they released anything newer than that. Um, where do we see the version? Come on, GitHub. I think it's the latest one, right? Unless I missed some, no, okay. So it's like there's there's been some few minor ones. Right, we got 061, which adds the, what was it? I don't remember if, yeah, I think it was nothing notable. There's like minor changes basically. Okay, anyway, so one of the latest version, let's put it this way. But the cool thing is that they've actually added the support for Hermes, which is the new JavaScript, high performance JavaScript engine from Facebook that they've announced uh, quite some time ago, which means that the apps will be a lot faster than before, which is uh, kind of cool. There's also the outline for what they're basically going to do for Milestone 4, how they're going to progress and all that kind of stuff. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's actually quite uh, exciting. Right, uh, that's it for releases. Now we got some libraries and demos and uh, one interesting link and that's basically it. So the first library we've got here today is create package JSON. Uh, the tiny command line utility that allows you to create a full on package JSON by essentially running uh, command line, by passing command line arguments. So if you need to dynamically create those uh, scaffold projects or do something like this, you can do it with this package. It also has the programmatic API, so you can generate them dynamically from your app if you want to. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. 
And the next thing we got here is .sto, the dot .file manager uh, with sto written in TypeScript. So if you are, if you own a lot of uh, computers and if you have to manage a lot of dot .files, do check it out. It actually looks pretty easy to use. It seems like it, you know, it has like sync, autocomplete, whatever the hell you want. Seems quite easy to use and very um, nicely made. So again, you know, if you manage a lot of dot .files, if you have computer, if you maybe migrate, if you bought a new laptop and need to migrate, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. Okay, next thing we got here is Fronty. This is a set of tools designed to orchestrate micro front ends. So this is sort of a, uh, I guess a meta framework that allows you to unify other frameworks into one app. Um, the docs are slightly confusing, let's put it this way, and not exactly detailed, but it seems like an interesting framework if you want to dig into it. All right, next thing is Swift Latte. There we go. This is this is the example I promised you with regards to WebAssembly. So this is. Uh, this is what you see is what you get browser-based Latte editor, right? So if you never heard about Latte, is the, um, how do you properly say it? It's like a document preparation system, right? This is what you call it. But essentially, if you ever wrote any papers, publications, you know, scientific specifically, all of the people use Latte to prepare nicely formatted PDF documents. And uh, usually it's a huge pain in ass to set up this thing on your computer to actually make it work. And then you always have the problems with compatibility. You got other problems with things not compiling and well, yeah, having essentially something that runs in the browser is sort of great. And there's been, there's already been tries to do that. Uh, but the thing is the previous tries, what they did is they actually had the backend running somewhere on the server and they just provided you sort of the nice editor and then they compiled on the backend anyway. Now what Swift Latte does is it takes the, um, I believe it is, um, what was it? Wait a second. Uh, CPDF etex and compiles it to WebAssembly. So there is one megabyte file, uh, which is VASM, which is the PDF, uh, CPDF etex compiled to WebAssembly. And then what it does is it takes the Latte and compiles it right in your browser. So you actually have the full on compilation going on in your browser. And I probably should disable that. Uh, it takes quite some time, like the compilation of complex stuff. So I tried using the TIGS, which is this uh, char drawing thing that it kind of works. I mean, the compilation doesn't fail, but it doesn't draw the correct thing here. But anyway, it takes ages to like, not ages, but you know, a couple of minutes, good couple of minutes to compile because this thing is pretty complex, even on my machine, but it does work and it does produce results that are pretty good. And if you do a simple document, it actually is a lot faster. So you can, yeah, you know, you can, as you can see here, it actually drawn the uh, letters, but not the edges and 3D stuff that text does. But uh, anyway, this is impressive as hell. So if you are interested in, in Latish or WebAssembly or how this works, do check it out. It's actually really cool. Uh, you can also self-host this. And if you're a researcher, there is a research paper available. So you can, you know, check it, cite it, uh, read it. And uh, it is actually really cool. I should start it as well. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is Nano Neuron. Uh, blah, let me try that again. Uh, seven simple JavaScript functions that give you a feeling of how machines can actually learn. So what I would call this is a basically very cool and simple introduction to neural networks. So if you ever wanted to learn how neural networks work, but were confused about the whole, you know, thing, uh, the, the whole weights and um, what are the other parameters? I don't remember. Uh, anyway, if you were confused about the whole neural network things and, you know, didn't want to get into mathematics and just wanted some code and to understand how this works, then this Markdown file, essentially this repo does this in just seven functions and does it incredibly well. Like this is one of the best explanations I've seen from sort of practical perspective. Uh, I think it's still the um, uh, three brown, one blue uh, video on uh, neural networks is better than this. But this repo is also really, really cool. Uh, three blue, one brown. I always confuse that. Anyway, so his videos are possibly the best explanations of neural networks I've ever seen. And this repo comes in probably second. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out, it's quite amazing. 
Okay, next thing we got here is React Cola, a web cola wrapper for React. This basically allows you to do the force uh, constraint layouts uh, using React, which uh, seems to work quite nicely. It seems to, you know, sim relatively simple API, nothing super fancy here. All your React components and stuff and just wraps it in web cola and does the layouting for you. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. Uh, the next thing we got here is Reg, native ESM package manager. So this is uh, essentially an attempt at a uh, package manager for native ES modules that is built to enable dependency management for universal JavaScript. And it is still highly experimental, it's still likely to break. So, you know, not, do not use it for production. But the idea seems very interesting. The API also seems quite nice. You can like publish packages, install packages, uh, pull packages, and it works with like dependencies, nested dependencies and everything. And uh, it only works with ES modules, as it says. Uh, but it's interesting, like, I wonder if NPM would change if they would drop the common JS and just switch to the ES modules, or we maybe we'll see the emer new emerging package manager that would replace NPM with uh, once the ES modules take over the common JS. They'll be very, very curious to see how that will develop. Anyway, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, it seems uh, pretty interesting. All right. Last library we got here for today is No UI Slider, a lightweight JavaScript range slider library with full multi-touch support. It's uh, basically a very, very nice slider. I think there was a demo somewhere there. Was there a demo? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it basically looks like this. Nothing super fancy. You can style it yourself. It's, you know, it's a double slider, range slider. And it's super lightweight and uh, quite easy to use. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. Okay, that is it for the libs and demos. Last thing I got to show you today is this uh, public APIs wrap on GitHub that is a collective list of free APIs that can be used in software and web development. Uh, so it's essentially, um, if you want to build some sort of a demo but don't have any data or you know just want to base on something very specific like books or cryptocurrencies or finance or music, then this list got you covered. It's basically categorized. It also has the notes for course, which means you can build a client side only app and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna build this very fancy JavaScript UI for, I don't know, random cats, for example. Hey, I, that, that's a th oh, of course, that's a thing. And uh, yeah, that's basically it from my side. Um, I, I don't really have any, anything else to say. So if you guys have any questions or suggestions, Feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Uh, if you have any projects I might have missed or you built something or you found a cool article that I haven't covered today, throw it in the chat. If not, then we can just wrap it up here. Um, while you're thinking, uh, you can find all the links I mentioned on bxjs.dev or on our GitHub. We have a Telegram channel where I gather all the links over the week. So if you want to see unfiltered list of everything I find over the duration of the week, you can follow it there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter for reposts and announcements of stuff that I do. And we also have a Discord server where we basically talk about JavaScript and video games. That's basically it from my side. Um, doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So I guess that would be it from my side for today. Thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this stream. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching the video of this and I see you next time. Bye.